Good morning, Hillcrest. Would you please stand? This is the day that God's made. Let's worship, rejoice. God because of the mighty saving acts that he's performed throughout history and he has done so many great and marvelous things but also our worship together looks forward to a time when we will all be together the Bible says people from every tribe and nation and tongue will gather and they'll, they'll bow before him and worship him so it's a great looking back but it's also a great looking forward Chasing the high 
Mr. Nick Betcher on the stage left, filling in for Brad Tripoli. <laughs> Nick and his touring group called the Reverend Few are all over the country. Look them up. They're, if they're ever singing locally, you should go hear them. But for now, would you have a seat? Because he is, he is playing locally today, right now, here. All right, let's join together in prayer. Father, we do greet you this morning with our shouts of praise, with our songs of thanksgiving and great joy. And Lord, this moment, we bow ourselves to you. We give you all that we have and are as an act of worship. Lord, every aspect of this service, I pray, would not just be a going through the motions. We were here, we went to church. But God, that we would be the church and we would experience your presence and we would just delight in the fact that you're here with us and that our batteries would be recharged, our tanks would be refilled so that we can meet the challenges you have for us this week in Christ Jesus. Lord, we have failed you, we know that. We are not perfect, we know that well, but we thank you that your spirit lives in us and through us and we thank you for the opportunity to encourage one another and to be thankful in your presence. That's our prayer today in Jesus' name. Amen.
our love to him once again, knowing that there will be a day when he will return, if not during our lifetimes. At some point, he says he doesn't even know when, but my Father in heaven, he says, knows. What's he doing right now? He's preparing a place for us. Amen? Amen. This life is short. I don't know where you are in your journey, but in where I am, there's a whole lot more behind me than in front of me, probably. Probably. But, uh, you know, God, God knows our days, our times. He's ordained all of them. Before we lived a one, it said he planned them out for us. So he is a good God. fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my
Good morning, and thank you for joining us for worship at Hillcrest. Here are some upcoming events that may interest you. As always, more information about these and all Hillcrest activities can be found online at hillcrest.church slash bulletin or by scanning the QR code on the screen. November 11th and 12th is our 32nd annual Labor of Love holiday market. Join us on the Hillcrest campus Friday, November 11th, 10 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. and Saturday, November 12th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m for food, fun, and lots of shopping. Proceeds from the food sales and booth rentals benefit our student ministry to fund their various mission activities throughout the year. Hillcrest Life Groups are invited to come eat dinner on Friday night at the Holiday Market. Our annual church-wide Thanksgiving lunch will be held in the Hillcrest MPC on Sunday, November 20th at noon. Be sure to sign up for reservations. We will have a special called business meeting on Wednesday, November 16th at 6 p.m. to vote on the Hillcrest 2023 spending plan. Jonathan Yates and the committee chairs will be available to answer any questions on Sunday, November 13th at 4 p.m. in the Fellowship Center. Contact Jonathan for more information. Hillcrest family, thank you so much for supporting us financially. Perhaps you have noticed the new construction in the portico area at the front of the church. This would not be possible without the financial support of members like you. There are a few convenient ways for you to give. You can make your check payable to Hillcrest Church or give online through the church website. Just go to www.hillcrest.church and click on Give. Thanks again for your financial gifts. Again, you can find more information about all of these activities and more at hillcrest.church slash bulletin. Finally, don't forget to fill out the connection card. You'll find it in your bulletin or online. The connection card gives us a chance to know you were with us today, and it gives you a chance to respond to what you've heard. All you have to do is fill in your name and email address and place it in the offering plate at the end of the service. If you're visiting with us today, you can pick up a copy of our pastor's book, Winning Ways, for free at one of the exit doors behind you. And if you want to know more about placing your faith in Jesus or joining our church, there's a spot in the card to ask for that information too. Thank you for listening. Now let's listen to today's message. Good morning. Today's reading is from Daniel chapter 3, verses 14 through 27. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot 
that the flames and of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate you reading the scripture today. I, I told your husband before the service, I gave you a passage with a lot of tough words in it. You did great. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd be with us as we look into what your word has to say to us so that we can remain still in faith and we can stand still in faithfulness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In the summer of 1940, the Germans were poised to overwhelm more than 350,000, mostly British troops. Uh, the Germans had surrounded them in the seaside French town of Dunkirk. When a British naval officer reported their plight to London, he cabled to London just three words, but if not. Those three words come from this passage that Denise just read to us. Three Jewish men threatened with death in a fiery furnace for refusing to bow down to a Babylonian idol. And they replied, as the then familiar King James Version would have put it, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. But if not. In a day and an age where people were accustomed to reading the Bible regularly and hearing it read to them, it was just those three words that they needed to recall the entirety of the story of Daniel chapter 3. And they understood the cabled message that was sent to them in London. Their boys urgently needed help in Dunkirk, but even if it didn't come, they would refuse to give in. Soon a makeshift armada of merchant marine boats and pleasure uh, uh, cruisers and small fishing boats started their way across the English Channel and miraculously over 338,000 troops were saved before the German uh, troops came in and invaded Dunkirk. Like the soldiers, the three Hebrew men in Daniel 3 believed God could miraculously rescue them, but they also knew that asking God for a rescue was not like ordering a meal from a waiter. God could say yes or God could say no in his own good wisdom and in his own good grace. Now one day you are going to be backed up against the sea in your own personal Dunkirk. It may be heartbreak with your kids. It may be some betrayal of your marriage partner. It may be word from a doctor that changes your entire life. And when that time comes, not if, but when that time comes, how will you respond? Daniel chapter three will help you a great deal. So I want you to get out your sermon notes and I want you to look at the first point on your notes. It's an obvious point that you are going to face difficult times living as a faithful stranger in this world. Now, we learn, what we learn from Daniel chapter 3 applies to whatever circumstance we face. Uh, and there are a number of circumstances we face that non-believers face as well. Uh, so if your car starts spinning out of control, 
on a slick road, the same physics will apply to you as apply to a non-believer whose car is spinning out of control. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that in a lot of the things we face, we face because we are humans living in a broken world. And so we face sickness or we face challenges or we face difficulty just as humans living in a broken world. And certainly what we learn in Daniel chapter 3 can help us understand how to deal with those types of difficulties. But Daniel chapter 3 is especially for those situations we face as not as humans living in a broken world, but as believers living in an unbelieving world. If you've read the book of Daniel before, you know that the first half of the book is about Daniel and three of his friends who were taken into exile when Babylon invaded Jerusalem. Last week we're in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk was uh, a prophecy that was uh, uh, pre presented to the people on the eve of the Babylonian invasion of Jerusalem. And Babylon did come in and they demolished the walls of Jerusalem and they tore down the temple. And then they took the cream of the crop, the best and brightest citizens, uh, and carried them off into exile. Now this was a part of a strategy of this vast empire of Babylon at the time. Wherever they went, conquering different territories, they would take the cream of the crop and bring them in and train them and develop them so that they could assist the Babylonians in ruling the lands that they had conquered. So what makes the book of Daniel so relevant for Christians today is that you and I are sort of exiles in our own country. We increasingly feel that. We love our country. We serve our country and its military. We, we, uh, uh, we, we go and vote in the voting booth in hopes that uh, good things will happen to our country. But the reality is that increasingly our values are not lining up with the culture that is around us. We have different values, different ways of behaving. We have different sexual ethics. We have different life ethics. We get these things from the Bible, and we believe that the Bible is God's word to us. And that makes us increasingly strangers, foreigners, exiles in our own country. And from time to time, that difference will lead to difficulty. And Daniel's three friends could tell you that that's true. Now this book is about Daniel for the most part, which makes chapter 3 interesting because Daniel doesn't show up at all in Daniel chapter 3. At the end of chapter 2, Daniel is elevated to a high office in the land of Babylon, and he requests that the king grant uh, some choice leadership positions to the three men he trusted most, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And now in here in chapter 3, Daniel is apparently back in the capital city of Babylon in the royal court, and his three friends are in one of the outer provinces uh, taking on their responsibilities. And they are known in this chapter as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were not the names their mamas gave them. Those were the names that the occupiers gave them. The Babylonian pagans gave them these pagan names as a part of this process of training them in Babylonian ways of thinking so that they could assist Babylon in ruling over Judah. Now for our scripture reading, I only asked Denise to read the last half of Daniel chapter 3. Why were these three men in the fix that they were in? Well, we find that out in the first half of Daniel chapter 3. In the first half of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar sets up this 90-foot tall statue. It was a symbol of Babylon. It was a symbol of the king's rule over Babylon. It was a symbol of the gods who enabled this king to rule over Babylon as far as he was concerned. And he ordered all the citizens and exiles to pay homage to this, this idol, this shrine. Now, it was a practical solution to a very real-world problem. He had invaded all these territories. He had all these uh, elite people from these various territories all in Babylon together. And in one way, he believed that he could unite them was to unite them in uh, recognizing the same authority and recognizing the same gods who gave Nebuchadnezzar this authority. And, and, and most of these diverse peoples that were in Babylon really had no problem with this because most of the diverse peoples around the region of the time were polytheists. That means they worshipped or recognized a multiplicity of gods. And uh, when their nation was defeated, that just met up in the heavens. Their god had been at least temporarily defeated. And so in their heart, 
They can maintain their loyalty to their God and yet at the same time bow before this idol representing another God, uh, especially on pain of death. They could easily do this, but not so much the Israelite elites that had been taken into Babylonian captivity because they had been given the Ten Commandments. And the first two of the Ten Commandments was, you shall have no other God beside me and don't bow down to idols. And so here Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in this in this challenge. And on the one hand, they're doing what God told them to do in Jeremiah chapter 29. In Jeremiah chapter 29, as they were being led off into exile, all the exiled people were told to seek the peace and prosperity of the city into which God was leading them. They were to marry, they were to start businesses, they were to build homes, because if Babylon prospered, they would prosper. That's what we read in Jeremiah chapter 32, uh, chapter 29. And so these guys were, were doing this and they had been elevated to high office in Babylon and they wanted to faithfully serve and do well. And yet at the same time, they had these responsibilities, these obligations. They were committed to living faithfully as God's people. And sometimes that commitment clashed with the things that Babylon wanted them to do. And that's going to happen to you from time to time. That'll be your experience from time to time. You will be expected to conform to ways of thinking and ways of behaving that are at odds with the direction that God has told us to go as his people. And when that happens and you stand with God's word, it can negatively impact your ability to make progress vocationally or academically. It may impact the number of friends you may be able to have. It may, be, it may impact your uh, marriage prospects. And, and so Daniel chapter 3 is very relevant for us today. The lessons of Daniel chapter 3 apply to us whatever hardship we face, whatever fix we're in as human beings living in a broken world. But Daniel chapter 3, the lessons we find here apply especially to those of us, not just as humans living in a broken world, but as believers living in an unbelieving world. So what are those lessons? What can we learn from Daniel chapter 3? We learn that whatever hardships we face, whatever difficulties we face, can serve as a stage, a billboard, on which we get to put on display three things. So I want you to write these down in your notes. First of all, God's worth. Hardship sets the stage to display God's worth. So here's this balance that you have to maintain. On the one hand, the Bible does give us guidance on how to have peace and joy and success in this earthly life. You know that, don't you? I mean, haven't you read the book of Proverbs before? The book of Proverbs, if you read it seriously, tells you how to get ahead in business and how to have financial security and how to find a good marriage partner and how to be successful in your marriage and so on. God wants you to have joy and peace and security in earthly things, and that's a good thing. He's not opposed to that. And yet none of these things are the source of our security and self-worth and happiness. God is. And, and so we, we want to pursue these things. We, we want to enjoy these things when they come. And yet at the same time, we need to show the world that God is of greater worth than all of these things. Now, now, how do we show the world that? Do we show the world that by coming in here and singing the songs that John leads us in? Well, in a way, yes, and in a way, no. In a way, as John said earlier, when we sing these songs, it is preparation. Just like a football player uh, in the middle of the week, he opens up his playbook and he studies that playbook. That's what you're doing when you come in here and you sing these songs. You're, you're going over the plays. But the real challenge is when we face the rough and tumble and difficulty of life out there. And when we face the rough and tumble and difficulty of life out there and we're showing the world that God is worth more than anything that we would experience, then we get a chance to put on display His glory. You know, the, the motivational speakers will tell us that you can't always control the circumstances, but you can control your response to the circumstances. And that is true up to a point. But the Bible is telling us more. The Bible is telling us you can't always control the circumstances, but you can always control your allegiance. You can always control that. No matter what's happening in your life, whether things are going your way or not, you can always control your stubborn, stickable loyalty to the God who saved you. 
When these three young men were given a choice, bow or burn, that became an opportunity for them to display what God was worth to them. So look again at verses 17 and 18. They say, if we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. They were saying, God can deliver us. God can deliver us if he wants to, but if he does not, we're still going to stick with him because he is worth it all. I want you to circle in your notes or in your Bible, but even if he does not. These words may be the most important words in the story. For a lot of us, we love the rest of the story where the guys get rescued, and especially the dramatic way they get rescued. We love that part of the story. But this point may be the most important part of the story when they say, but even if he does not, we are going to stay loyal to him because he is worth it all. When the things that our world counts on for security and joy and self-worth are taken away from us, and yet the world still sees us glorifying God, confident in him, finding our joy and our self-worth and our security in him, what is that but putting on display God's glory, God's worth for the world to see. So hardship sets the stage for us to put on display God's worth. Here's a second thing to write down, God's presence. Hardship sets the stage to put on display God's presence. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar had ordered anyone refusing to bow down to this image that he set up, they were to be thrown into this fiery furnace. This seems like a really specific way to die, a very... A strange thing for them to have developed this elaborate superheated furnace just to throw people into it if they didn't bow down to this idol. There are a lot of biblical scholars that believe that the reason that this was the death penalty was because of the proximity to this furnace to where the idol was and it was close by because it was that furnace that forged that idol. It was that furnace that shaped that idol. And so that furnace still happened to be there. And if you didn't bow down to the idol, you'd be thrown into this, this furnace. Now that's interesting. It's interesting also, though, that verse 19 says about the king, his attitude toward them changed. Did you notice that? His attitude toward them changed. And uh, that tells me that uh, the king was as fond of these three young men as the king was and their friend Daniel. We see through the book of Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar was particularly fond of Daniel. And clearly he was fond of these three men too. But then his attitude toward them changed when, he, when they didn't do what he insisted that they do. And this, this could well happen to you as well. Things run along fine and good with your co-workers. Things run along well with your neighbors uh, as long as uh, you're all talking about the same subject that interests you and and then you, you invite their children and them to come along to an event at church and their kids have a whole lot of fun. Everything's going great. And then somewhere along the way they find that your values are not their values, that the things that are important to you are not important to them and their attitude toward you might well change at that point. And so he commanded, the king commanded that this furnace be made as hot as his anger. And as the story puts it, it was so hot that even the men who brought the prisoners to the mouth of the furnace were consumed by the heat. And yet, in one of the most fascinating parts of this story, shortly after these three young men are thrown into the furnace, what happens? The king looks in and sees them alive and walking around as if they had got up from their living room and went into the kitchen to get some chips. And not only that, he says that he recognized that there was a fourth man with them, one he called one like a son of the Gods. Take a look at verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Of course, reading this story as New Testament Christians, what do we see? We see Jesus, don't we? We see not a son of the gods, but the son of the God that is walking around with his Old Testament people at a time that they needed it most. A pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament story of Daniel. So as I said earlier, hardship sets the stage to display God's worth. 
when things are taken away from us that the world looks upon for their security and their worth and yet they see us rejoicing and celebrating in Jesus, we get to put on display his worth. But more than that, when we are telling people that Jesus is with us, we get to show people his presence in our lives because Jesus is, isn't he? He's alive. He rose from the dead. He came into our heart when we said yes to him. And so that means whatever hardship you're facing right now, Jesus is walking around in that fiery furnace with you. And when we talk to people about what Jesus is doing for us in our hardship, when we talk to people about the, the, the provision of wisdom and the provision of sustenance he is giving us in the midst of our hardship, what are we doing? We're putting on display his presence in the midst of our hardship. So we need to recognize then that hardship isn't a time where we give up on the faith. Hardship is a time where we display our faith. We display God's worth. We display God's presence. And then here's the third thing. We can display God's rescue. God's worth, certainly. God's presence, definitely. God's rescue, we can ask for that and hope that it comes. In verses 26 and 27, Nebuchadnezzar orders these young men who are walking around in this fiery furnace to walk out of the fiery furnace. And once they were out of the flames, notice who surrounds them. The people who surround them are the satraps and the prefects and the governors and the royal advisors. In other words, they were the very ones who in the first part of Daniel chapter 3, who for jealousy, jealousy pointed out to the king what these three men refused to do. And so they're the ones that are the most astonished, the very enemies of these men, and they're gathered around. And isn't that an interesting detail that the story ends on, that not even the smell of smoke, not even the smell of fire was upon them. Now let's rejoice when God comes through for us like that. I mean, certainly we need to keep in mind that that's not the main point of the story. We need to certainly keep that in mind. Don't, don't ever take Daniel chapter 3 as a formula for earthly success. Sometimes we can do that. There was a Southern Gospel song a few decades back based on Daniel chapter 3. And in that song, it had the line, they did not bow, they did not bend, and they did not burn. And whether the song meant this or not, a lot of people who listen to that song and a lot of people who read Daniel chapter 3 think that's the point of the story. That if you do not bow and you do not bend, then you will not burn. That God will rescue you from whatever hardship you're in. That's not the point of the story. Don't you remember the main point of the line is, but if not... Regardless of what God decides to do in this, I'm going to display his worth. That's what these th three young men were saying. And what we need to say as well. And yet God does rescue. And when God rescues us or when God rescues other people, we need to celebrate that. When the healing comes and absolutely baffles the doctors, we need to point people to the healer. When money comes, when we didn't know how we were going to keep a roof over our head, we need to praise God for that. When somebody hires us, when nobody seemed to be hiring, we need to thank God for that. Sometimes, sometimes we don't. We're so prepared for God to say no that we're, we don't know what to do when God says yes. Some country preacher said at one time that all of us are like hogs in an apple orchard. We enjoy all the blessings of life without ever looking up to see where they came from. And we can be like that sometimes, can't we? And, and so even though the point of the story is not God will rescue if you stay faithful to him, when God does rescue, let's point people to the rescuer. And let's thank God for that. Let's not forget all about it, just the moment that good things end up happening in our lives. Now in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, we are told this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you as though something strange were happening to you. Are you ready for what 1 Peter calls the fiery ordeal? That trial by fire that we read about in Daniel chapter 3. It's not a matter of if it's coming, it's a matter of when it's coming. Sometimes that fiery ordeal is just what any human being might face on a broken world. Sometimes that fiery ordeal comes precisely because you are a believer in an unbelieving world. But when that comes, you can display God's worth, you can display God's presence, and when God rescues you, you can celebrate that. Why? Because the Apostle Paul tells us God is for us. 
That's the main point of Romans chapter 8 in the New Testament. Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And then to put as exhibit A, the proof that God is for us, Paul points to the cross. Now, isn't this interesting? Nebuchadnezzar saw one like a son of the gods. As New Testament people, we understand he was the son of the God who was in that fiery furnace rescuing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And yet we know from the gospel stories, we know from the story of the cross, that that one who rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from their fiery trial endured his without rescue. And that's proof that God loves us. Jonathan Edwards, who was serving as pastor in a New England church in the 1700s, once preached about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before, the, the night before he went to the cross. You remember that the Bible tells us this little detail that he was so fervent in his prayer, so stressed about what was coming, he sweat like drops of blood coming from his forehead. And Jonathan Edwards said that he sweat in that way because he was already standing at the edge of that which makes us sweat, a fiery furnace that he would face the next day on the cross. Here's what Edwards said back in the 1700s. The thing that Christ's mind was so full of at that time was without a doubt the same with that which his mouth was so full of. It was the dread which his feeble human nature had of that dreadful cup which was vastly more terrible than Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace. He had then a near view of that furnace of wrath into which he was to be cast. He was brought to the mouth of the furnace that he might look into it and stand and view its raging flames and see the glowings of its heat that he might know where he was going and what he was about to suffer. This was the thing that filled his soul with sorrow and darkness. This terrible sight, as it were, overwhelmed him. In other words... What Edwards was saying was the very experience that the Son of God enabled Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to get out of, a fiery furnace, he did not get out of. He faced it to the end. He faced it thoroughly because he was taking away our sin and the punishment that our sins deserved on the cross. And that's why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 could say, here is proof that God is for you. God is for you because he was for you ultimately on the cross. He bore it all in the person of His Son on the cross so that your sin that separates you from God might be removed and you might have forever fellowship with God starting now and going on into forever. And if that kind of God is for you, who can be, what can be against you? And so that's why we need to hold on to the truth that we learned from Daniel chapter 3 because they continue to apply into our New Testament life as New Testament believers. With that in mind, then let's go to the Lord in prayer and thank Him for these great truths today. Father, we want to be ready to face our trial by fire like these three Hebrew young men. We're going to obey 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 that tells us not to be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes as though something strange were happening to us. Instead, we'll prepare ourselves to display Your worth and Your presence even as we ask you to display your rescue. And we renew our awe and wonder in Jesus when we think that he willingly was not rescued from his fiery trial, but endured it for us to save us. May those of us who believe deepen our love for Jesus because of this. And may those of us who do not yet believe commit to that kind of Jesus today. I pray these things in his name. Amen. There's a card inside your bulletin. I want you to pull it out right now, won't you, from your bulletin. If you're watching online, there's a, a digital version of this. And we'd love everybody to fill this out. Just let us know you're with us today. And if you're a guest of ours, this will be your registration of attendance so that we can email you or mail you some more information about our church uh, to you. Uh, but if you've got a prayer request, here's a card for you to turn in that prayer request. If you have a decision that you're thinking about today to join up with this church or join up with Jesus, you can indicate it on this card, and I'll get back with you if you leave your contact information so I can do so. Now, you can get, me, get with me right after the service is up. There's a coffee fellowship, and I'm there at the coffee fellowship. Let's talk right now about your decision for Christ or your decision to join up with this church. But a lot of people at least like to fill out this card and 
let that interest be known in this way. Uh, I want the offering bearers, the ushers, to come up now and our musicians to come up. And uh, as these offering plates are passed, you can place the completed card in the plate. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and then as we conclude the service today, uh, what I want you to do is uh, be ready to maybe hang around at least for 15 minutes for our coffee fellowship. It's in the gym. Just follow the signs, follow the crowd. You'll get back there. And uh, if you haven't been invited to a life group, they hang around for an hour and uh, go deeper into the Bible study. And so I would encourage you to stay for an hour for that. And if somebody hasn't invited you to their life group, you see me in the coffee fellowship time and I'll get you to the right uh, place. One thing that I want to mention, uh, it was mentioned during the announcement video, is that we have our special called business meeting come up. And I wanted you to remember that. That's coming up not uh, this Wednesday, but next Wednesday. But uh, this week, we have our holiday market. And uh, I want you to be thinking about how you can support this holiday market. I want you to come and support these vendors that uh, take the time to come and sort of display all their wares in our building. But I also want you to come during the, either the lunchtime or the dinner time, uh, the supper time on, 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 on Friday or the lunchtime on Saturday. And come with your office. You can bring your office if you're uh, still in your working years. Bring your office with them on Friday and make that your, your lunch date. Or get with your life group and get together on, on, on uh, Saturday together with your life group and eat lunch and then stroll around and see what the vendors have to offer. And now John Cameron is our Deacon of the Week. He's going to be praying today. And he also just happens to be our youth minister. And so what I want you to do is I want you to pray for labor our Labor of Love holiday market, even Absolutely. as we pray for this offering. Yeah. Thank and you. Marina and her crew. That's Absolutely. right. <laughs> All right, pray with me now. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, grateful for the blessing in this church, Lord, um, Lord, for the fellowship, uh, for the worship, Lord, for the scripture that you bring us, Lord, um, Lord, for the uh, for us, Lord, that are here, um, Lord, that, that are uh, part of the labor of love um, event that's going on this this uh, Friday and Saturday, Lord. I just, um, Lord, I'm so thankful for the team uh, that's worked just diligently and, and, and a lot of hours and, and hard work, uh, Lord, to get that up and running. Um, Lord, for the support of this church, I just pray, Lord, for just continued um, energy uh, for those for those guys, uh, Lord, and, and I pray, Lord, just for uh, Lord a blessing um, on the vendors and, and those that are that have their hands uh, involved in this, Lord, that you just bless them as well. Uh, Lord, I just pray, Lord, for the uh, offering, Lord, that we're uh, about to take up, Lord, that uh, Lord, they just uh, use this, Lord, uh, to bless those uh, that are faithfully giving here this morning, Lord, but. Uh, uh, also, Lord, to bless those that, um, Lord, are, are finding themselves in a really difficult and a tough and a challenging time, Lord, that need to hear, uh, Lord, these words from uh, Daniel, uh, Lord, that, uh, uh, Lord, life is tough and there are hardships and there, and there are uh, things that are going to come along that don't seem fair, Lord, but, uh, Lord, that you you have come, Lord, for us, Lord, um, and, Lord, there's just so much hope and so much joy in that message, Lord, and I just I pray, Lord, that this, uh, this offering, Lord, just goes out and blesses us. Um, people in this community and, and, and even further. Uh, Lord, in your son's name we pray. Amen. One, two, three, four. Strength will rise as we wait. Thank you. 
have a great day. Our 